Hi there, I'm Creator, and welcome to a quick introduction to Imperium Maledictum. This is going to be our next campaign, some people have asked for a quick overview of the rules. So, Imperium Maledictum is the latest in the 40k rule sets, and it is a evolution of the Dark Heresy Rogue Trader, the old Fantasy Flight system. It's done by Cubicle 7, and while a lot of things are similar to that system, quite a lot of them are different. The basics are the same, it's a roll under D100 system where your characters will, let's see if I've got just, that's a patron, here we go, because I've entered a test character here. Your characters have a weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, agility, intelligence, perception, willpower and fellowship. When they make a test, they will go to their skills, which are long. And then make a roll, which can be set anywhere between very easy, which adds 60 to your target, or very hard. So have you make a difficult awareness roll. And then you can make it public. You can have advantage. So advantage means that you... I'll roll it and show you. So with advantage, if you can flip the dice to make it better, you will. Um, let's try something to get a bit better at. Disadvantage is the opposite. If you um, your dice rolls could be flipped to make it worse, you have to do that. So in this case, flipping 13, 31 to 13 doesn't help, but flipping 96 would. Let's try it another one, see if we can get one to actually fail. There we go. So 89 got flipped to 98. Let's try that with that. Uh, that. So I should say this is the paid module for Foundry. Uh, so it's going to do lots of this stuff for us. And then here we go. 76 was flipped to 67, but that's still not enough. As you can see, what we're getting here is degrees of success or failure. And the more of those you get, the better things have gone for you, or in many cases, the worse. So, you've got a big skill list, you've got talents, um, and these do things like, uh, say, once per mission, you find a piece of equipment using in your backpack, pocket or slings. Equipment zero, but fees have been acquired recently. Uh, anything for a set of photo visors to uh, that. So it's little things that make your character like a bit, you know, just have those advantages. Um, obviously, some are able to do because you know, it's still a fairly new system. So the key thing with this is that you would start patron. So we're starting this this weekend um, on Sunday. We're going to be doing character creation live because. It's great to see everyone meshes together and make a patron. The patron is kind of like, well, he's obviously the boss. He's the guy who's put the team together. And his I to do that, you have to basically pick a faction or you can randomly roll it. And every faction has a bonus. Um, and then you also build what's called boons and liabilities. So once you have your faction, um, so you, you just because your guys say an ad, Adeptus Mechanicus doesn't mean you have to be Adeptus Mechanicus. He's going to be drawing from any of those factions to put his team together. But it just means he is working to, say, move the Adeptus Mechanicus forward. Um, you'll have a motivation. Some of these are kind of like conflict. He'll start fights. He'll get information, gather material, build his reputation and unity. There's always a choice that you can choose these as a group, or you can randomly roll them. Um, so, here's a Danina, how angry he is. But the main thing is boons and liabilities. These are a little bit more random, or it can be chosen, but the idea is a boon is something the guy will help. So let's pick an air support here, because it's fun. Your patron will always get you good quality planets to travel on outside craft. Once per mission, you call a focused airstrike or close air support. 
This allows free attack to either frag or crack missiles to range the other 60. The uh, exact nature of the airstrike may change. Fly over and bolt two gunship, make it into two attacks of heavy bolters, a single last cannon. Yeah. Basically, your guy is there giving you close air support. And that's something that can be really useful, it's just like you're mid fight and you just go, okay, you're gonna need that air support now. On the other hand though, you get liabilities. So this guy, although he kills air support, he's a big fan of communicating, convoluted communicate. So everything needs to be coded communications. Ciphers are changed regularly and may obscure the message. Yeah, you may want to call that air support in, but you know, do you know today's code phrase? Um, and they go all the way up to like excommunicated, where your guy is a traitor to the Imperium. Uh, and this is kind of one of those that says a major part of the game, maybe to clear your patron's name. Uh, minus free interest with, with pretty much everybody. That's a major problem. So, the idea is you get a, a faction one for free, and then every boom you pick, a liability comes with it. So, that means your patron becomes this kind of, I just made a cheap one up here. So this guy's an Aptus Mechanicus, um, he gets the page one in them, and just the basic. Then you move on to character creation. The character creation is pretty cool um, because let's find the right not creating your character. Um, you can be completely random and get bonus experience, or you can be like focus in to exactly the character you want and just like, you'll get back. You don't have to pick that for any one stage, so it's pretty cool. Um, so you start with your characteristics, then you get your origin, which world are you born on. So of course this is all hyperlinked. So if you've gone for an aggro world, you get plus size strength, plus five to toughness, agility or willpower, and you get a shoddy entrenching tool, you brought your spade with you. Then you can get your faction, again, nice random tables. And then the other interesting thing is it is a classless system, but there are roles. Um, so you can be anything you want. You know, you can even become a psycho halfway through the campaign if you want. Um, but your role will push you in a certain direction um, by giving you some bonus. Um, so like the warrior here gives you that's what I'm clicking on. Choice of dead eye, disarm, drill, duelist, tactical movement, two handed cleave, pre advantages on those. And if I go back to Sapentis' character sheet, cheat, up here you've got advancements. When you spend XP, like going up a level will get cost different amounts depending on how much you've got. So getting these early advancements is good because they are free. And you get a good selection of equipment. But if we go back to the clan book thing, rules, um, does it been cover advancements here? It might not in this bit. But yeah, your XP will change depending on how much um, you've actually kind of spent. So of course, the more you have in earlier thought in your stats, the more expensive it is to expand it. And of course you can, I should just leave this up, I don't know why it keeps your sh shutting down. On skills, you could increase those up to four times. Uh, and then you can specialize at the fifth point. So, you know, it gives you quite a lot of choices here. You can always remove those as well. So yeah, you can advance your skills. So in this case, getting athletics four would cost, if you look at the bottom here, it goes 850 to 1000, 150 XP. Athletics, 
it would be 50 to get the new one, 100 to get the next one, or that. So it gets more expensive as you go. This is this character is going to get deleted when we create a new one. It's fine. This is just us trying to learn the character generation, but it's useful for us here. And again, it's not too expensive to get those up. But here, when it's got 41, you see the number goes up more. So XP can be used. So if you go 100% random, I think you start with 250 XP. And that can be used to show off any weaknesses in your character. Right. Oh, I'll keep shutting him. I'm going to need him later. There you go, test bed. Um, psychic powers. So, powers of the wolf is still here, you'll be happy to know, but it's changed slightly. You have a kind of a battery you can run. No, battery's the wrong way. Warp charge is what you call it. Um, the more you use powers, the more warp charge you build up. When it gets to a certain level, you have to, you risk, if your warp charge exceeds your warp threshold, you risk the powers of the warp, which of course has a, um, I've just got random stuff here. I'm not sure I was thinking of. Which is everything from like just doing minor things all the way up to opening the eye. That's, that's the pearls there, yeah. So you've got Psychic Phenomena. Also, yeah, if you overcharge, you get both of that. So what you have to do is occasionally you purge yourself. And then, so you roll on this table, plus 10 for every warp charge you shed. I think it's up to your... Um, you can have up to your willpower bonus, which is the first thing here. So, say this character was a um, Psyker, his willpower 31, his bonus is 3. He could have up to 3 warp charge before daily. So he'll have to then purge himself, which is run on the Psychic Phenomena table. Which is stuff like a whole frost. If you roll the same thing twice, it becomes a lingering effect, which means that zone forever has that problem. Um, so this one here, the air becomes stale, permanent infringements of a choke grenade. So if you're firing off lots of psychic powers in one location, you may cause some serious damage to it. Which, if it's some random gang location, isn't a problem. If you're fighting in your main base, that's going to become an issue. But as I say, Perils of the Warp, you can still rip open the things and become a demon host. So it's all there, but it's more managed. It's not like your first spell is likely to cast you, like, if you open a cause a demon host. It's more likely the more you push yourself. But there's still that random chance. Um, so, combat is probably the next thing to go, because this has changed a fair bit. We've added in something called supremacy, or superiority, sorry. So superiority is getting trying to get around the idea of Mink standing and fighting for the like, for the rest of eternity. Because quite often you get to a combat where you've killed half the guys, the leaders are dead, and you, you spend like five rounds clearing up some mooks. Superiority is one of those things that once you get beyond a stat called resolve, um, which is let's see, best three. We'll just find a Citizen and Infractionist. Oh, here we go. There's Imperial Citizen here. He's got a resolve of one. So, you see in the combat thing we've got superiority. If your superiority goes above their resolve, um, I'm still finding myself. Rules. Superiority. So your superiority will go up and down, um, and you can set it quite high to begin with. So for a battle, if you know your enemy, know the battlefield, know their players, then you'll get plus three. Um, so basically that's, if you've got a good idea what you're going into, so you know your enemy are, a gang is armed with lance, 
plus pistols, that's good. You know you're fighting in an open. Um, have have heavier, that's good. And you've come up with a clever idea. Um, you could probably get up plus three. Um, it goes up and down. If you kill an enemy leader, it goes up one. If you get an enemy elite, it goes up one. Um, killing more than their resolve in a turn goes up one. Goes down if you take a crit critical wound, character's taken out, or like some sudden change of the battlefield. So that's a GM able to throw stuff in. Um, so non player have a resolve. Um, and you normally use the leader's resolve. And then if you defend your own turf, you get plus one. And once your superiority goes above the road, they either flee, surrender, or charge if there's no way out. So superiority is something that you're tracking a lot, moving it up and down, and trying to keep things going. Um, so you can use superiority as well to gain a, su a success level bonus to one test of your choice each turn. Um, equal to the total superiority um, you have. So if you're plus three, you can get a plus three success bonus. Um, yeah, I'm desperate. So that's all that. Flow of battle is changed. So turn order uh, is still initiative, which is checked. But the battlefield is now designed to zones. So, can I get this picture bigger? Yeah. So in this example, you've got zone one here, zone two, which is a acid lake, zone three, with barrels you can shoot to make a, a major hazard, a barrier, and zone four. So moving inside your zone is normally free unless you're slow. Moving between zones is one. Running is, you know, an entire action gives you free. And shooting is range, so shooting inside here is close, medium, long, etc. Um, yeah, long range is up to two zones, extremes, out, anything outside long. Speed, you're slow, normal, slow, or fast. And you can be prone standing up, stuff like that. Damage is also changed, so when you shoot at somebody, you take other things into their account, you roll your attack. Then you, the damage is set. There's no more D10s exploding, stuff like that. You will just roll a flat damage. So if you hit someone with your stub pistol, you do six damage, which is reduced by armor. So it's a lot more granular, a lot more kind of like less random. Uh, hopefully a bit less rocket tag. Um, so yeah, wounds, of course, if you get hit, you suffer damage, you get a wound, a very pointed damage. Um, there's two ways you can get critical wounds. If you go above your maximum wound, or your enemy scores a critical hit. In this case, a critical hit being... Um, but this is just like showing me that. So for a critical hit... It's when the um, dice match, isn't it? Yeah, when you roll doubles on combat, you get a critical hit. That's an immediate critical wound. If you roll doubles on a failure, you fumble, and you have to roll on a fumble table, um, which can cause you all sorts of problems. So yeah, doubles are still something to watch out for. Um, if you go above your um, maximum wounds, you take your damage and then roll a d10 plus the excess damage to take that amount of uh, critical. So there's a critical hit tables, obviously. We love critical hit tables. And that's stuff like, you know, losing fingers and teeth and, you know, two getting ripped apart and brutally died. Um, there's not as many, there's not impact rending on explosive, it's just one, so let's simplify that down. Um, the other thing to notice, if you have untreated critical wounds 
more than your toughness bonus, you're dying. So normally, that'll be fine because you'll take your hits. So you, if you've got as many wounds as you got, he's got 13 wounds and the ability to take three criticals. So that would be hit twice, twice, three times with a stubber without any crits. And you take one, they hit again, two, hit again, three. So unless your opponent gets lucky, those critical wounds are going to be building up slowly or quickly, and then you get taken down. Um, at that point you're dying, uh, and then you need medical treatment to be put back up. Which brings us to our last little section. Well, actually no, second to last, because there's one other thing I'm going to cover after this. Fate. Fate has changed slightly, uh, but not massively. Every player starts with free fate. You can spend these to be roll a fail test, gain advantage on a test before it's rolled, add left one success level to a test after it's rolled, uh, act first in a round, ignore effects from your critical wounds until the start of the next turn, or remove a condition. Like prone. If you do prone, you get one wound back. You then can burn fate, which means you reduce your total amount. Mostly this is used for dying. Um, if you're left for dead, you somehow survive. You still got all your crit wounds and stuff like that, but you're not actually dead. You can block all incoming damage. Um, which if you, because if you, if you die another day, you're still out of the fight. Um, but you're down. You can, but if you decide you need to stay in the fight, you may want to just use the Emperor's Protection to block it. Uh, you can reduce corruption. Corruption changed a little bit. Um, it's more of a point system than that. I have to cover that as well. Um, you can choose your success level. So you can just say, I will always win. Or you can gain a superiority. But that then reduces your total. When you run out of spate points, you're probably going to die. We'll cover corruption next. Okay, so corruption is now gained for stuff like seeing a lesser demon and stuff like that. Um, you can resist it for a fortitude or discipline test. Um, and you will have a maximum up to twice special willpower, something like that. Um, so you'll gain it up to four. I think a greater team is four corruption straight off if you don't resist it. And of course you don't... You reduce it by your success levels. So you, you might see one and be fine. You might see four and think four levels select. So yeah, yeah, no, I know it's a demon. Um, yeah, why does it say corruption excessive mutation? Uh, willpower plus your toughness bonus. You, you then are in danger. Um, when you fail to test risk of succumbing to corruption, you remove your corruption equal to your willpower bonus and you gain a uh, detail on even number, it's a mutation, or it's odds malignancy. So that corruption is going to be a bit, again, it's slower, but will still be quite dangerous. And you can only have your toughness bonus or willpower bonus in there before you fall to chaos. Uh, so the last thing I want to do, cover is the strength between missions. So you now have, after every mission, so like a, the game's designed to be running missions. So your patient will go, go me, get me the MacGuffin. You go get your MacGuffin, you come back and you've got a pile of dead corpses and you've accidentally blown up um, a, a, a priest. Various things will happen. Everyone has their influence level, um, which we're having a little moment problem changing at the moment, um, but we'll short figure that out. That influence is used to get bonuses with a faction. So if you walk up and you've got influence five um, with like 
the priesthood of the Adeptus in Mistorum, you'll go, ah, yes, hi, it's me, and you get plus five to your skill success levels because they will fall over themselves. On the other hand, if you're minus five, you walk into the bar and everyone grabs their gun. That changes depending on what you do in the mission. So if you accidentally blow up a priest, the, the Adeptus Mistorum is not going to like that. It's probably going to reduce their um, success level. If you said, I'm here to help my patron and then blow up a priest, your patron has problems with that. The patron's influence levels are tracked separately. And it could be that I'm doing, as a GM, doing stuff like, um, uh, yes, off you go. Go get us a MacGuffin. And knowing the MacGuffin is going to ang anger at the priest itself. But, yeah, that's all secret and tracked. So, yeah, once you've done that, you then get to run an event. Because, you know, random things happen, like you get arrested. Um, all the way up to good things like you meet a good, uh, very, get a victory celebration, or you get a very important visitor. So, yeah, that's good. That's just like a line of bit of flavor that can get thrown in. And finally, you've got endeavors, which is a kind of in-between thing you can do to improve yourself. Uh, like get superiority or um, try and ruin opposing reputations. There's a group of endeavors, or you can do individual ones to get money, commissions, worships. There's loads of stuff you can do in between to try and boost your character and ready yourself for the next mission. All right, I think I've waffled on for long enough. If you've made it to the end, thanks very much. Uh, please join us for character creation. Uh, this will be the start of the playlist. And thanks for watching.